All right, welcome back to AI for 2021 Finance Summit presented by Dot Data. Our next speaker is Andrew Green, Managing Director and Lead XVA Quant at Scotiabank. Please join me in welcoming Andrew to our virtual stage. Thank you. So my name is, is Andrew Green. I, I'm the Managing Director and Lead XVA Quant at Scotiabank where I've been for the last five years. And today I'm going to talk about uh, Deep XVA. And this is related to a, a project that we've been working on since I arrived at Scotiabank to build a new XVA platform uh, for the bank. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what that all means uh, in just a moment. But before I do, um, just a, a disclaimer slide. And I've uh, also referred you to the legal messages at the end of this presentation. So, what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to start by introducing what we mean by XVAs or derivative valuation adjustments. Um, I'm going to explain what they are and then I'm going to move on to talking about XVAs and, and how you calculate them in outline and the, the computational cost that, that goes with that. Um, and then I'm going to explain that's really just to place uh, our use of deep learning into context. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how we can use deep learning to approximate derivative valuation routines in, a, in deeply learning derivatives. And then finally, I want to talk about deep adjoint XVA, which really integrates, which is really demonstrating how we've integrated deep learning into our XVA calculation and why, why it dovetails with that so very well. So let me start by introducing XVAs or derivative valuation adjustments. So I, I work within the, the derivatives, uh, derivative uh, part of the bank, and I, my responsibility is to build models for derivatives, and in particular for these uh, valuation adjustments. Now, they, when we value derivatives, um, we typically include um, the impact of market data. Uh, so, for example, interest rate interest rates uh, for FX, FX spot rates, commodity prices, etc. But these are, but traditionally, um, derivatives are valued on a single deal basis. So you, you value each individual transaction separately. Now, for, for, for the, the basic valuation, that works just fine, but it doesn't include a number of different factors, different risk factors, um, which are not, in, which can't be included in the underlying valuation. Now, Typically, these are because the effects that need to be added on can only be calculated at portfolio level. Mm -hmm. So that means these are effects that relate to um, the portfolio of transactions with a specific counterparty, with respect to actually perhaps all of the calculations that a, that a bank holds, all of the derivative calculations, or they relate to other factors such as margin or regulatory capital. And indeed, over the last few years, really since the, mostly since the, the financial crisis of 2007 to 2009, there's been a, a, an increasing number of XVAs or derivative valuation adjustments to account for different risk factors. Um, the, the original, the first one that most people are perhaps familiar, most familiar with is CDA, which deals with counterparty and indeed self credit risk. And this was actually introduced um, before the crisis and dates from really the, the turn of the millennium. Funding costs or FVA were introduced shortly after uh, the financial crisis. Um, and latterly, we've also seen the introduction of margin valuation adjustment that deals with uh, the funding costs associated with initial margin, which has become a, 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 a major feature of derivatives as, uh, as derivatives have become increasingly clear to central clearers, again, Post crisis, and then KVA, which is really a, which is really looking at the impact of regulatory capital or capital costs um, on on transactions of um, portfolios of transactions throughout their lifetime, reflecting the fact that uh, banks do need to set aside um, capital uh, associated with the derivative trades, um, and hence there is a there is a return on capital required that the bank needs to achieve. So those are XVAs. Now, broadly speaking, they all resolve to a relatively simple formula, 
um, although that, that simplicity um, belies a great deal of complexity in terms of computation, which I'll come to next. And you can see in this equation one, that what this really resolves to is an integral over time, um, where what we, we're integrating over is a, is a, is a, what we call an exposure profile and some probability density reflecting, uh, reflecting, for example, the probability of default in the case of counterparty credit risk. There's some discounting in there um, and it looks all looks very straightforward. A different XVAs have different resolved to different components in that formula. So for example, in the case of a unilateral CBA model, we calculate the, the, expect, the E of S resolves to the expected positive exposure. That is the, um, the, the net positive value uh, of the portfolio, less any collateral that's held um, as a function of time. FVA is, is broadly similar and, and relates to the, the value, the sum of the values, the future values as a function of time. And then for MVA, that resolves to some profile of expected initial margin. And for capital, that resolves to an expected profile of, of capital over the lifetime of the transaction. And then the, the probability density reflects, also reflects the type of risk factor that is being, uh, that is, that is being considered. And then there's normally some kind of pre-factor on the beginning of the interval. So it all looks relatively, relatively straightforward. But unfortunately, calculating those expected exposure profiles is relatively complex and, and costly from a computational point of view, as I'll now explain. So when we calculate XVAs, there are basically three steps. We have, we have to build a model and, and calibrate that model. And then we have to calculate the expected exposure profile. And then once we've done that, then we, we plug that expected exposure profile into that formula and, and perform some kind of numeric integration over that for the through the lifetime of the portfolio. And you can see in this in this uh, flow graph, this explains these steps. So basically, we use to to evaluate the expected exposure, whether whatever the type of exposure it is, we normally use um, Monte Carlo simulation. So you can see here that we start on the with the, the calibration step and then move through initializing Monte Carlo and then running the Monte Carlo simulation, which is split into four boxes and also colored in, in, in magenta um, to reflect the fact two, two features of this. One is that it is a highly parallelizable calculation and second, that it's also going to be run on GPU. But after that, we, we, reduce the, we reduce the simulation down to our expected exposure by averaging the results at every, at every time step in the future and then calculating the XVA integral. Now, how do we calculate that expected exposure? We run a Monte Carlo simulation, but then here, here is where it becomes very expensive because to calculate those exposures, you'll, re you'll recall that in the expressions for the exposure, we have the derivative value. And what we need to do to calculate the expectation is we need to calculate that expectation on a very large number of time steps running out to the maturity of that portfolio. So we need to, we need to run a Monte Carlo simulation. Monte Carlo simulation requires um, a large number of Monte Carlo paths to achieve convergence. So what that results to, results to is that for every time step, of which there may be hundreds, um, out to the maturity of the portfolio, which can be as much as 50 years into the future. And for every, for every, on every path of which there will also be thousands, uh, we need to value every derivative in the netting set. So it, it, you can see that we have to value these derivatives repeatedly. So unlike where we, uh, we at, at the end of every day, value the derivative portfolio and calculate the sensitivities, here we require to value those same portfolio derivatives thousands and thousands of times just to get the simple XVA value. And then we require to apply. Then what we do is once we've done that and we've got the value of the netting set, we apply that operator, uh, e.g. the max function, and then we average with every time step. So that's how we calculate the exposure. You can see already that it is an expensive process. Now, this is just an example of, of, an, of a 
the expected positive exposure is an interest rate swap, which is a, a very common type of interest rate derivative um, that that we we'd, that are, are commonly featured in in X ray in X ray calculations, um, and interest rate swaps. Um, one of the most common instruments um, used um, is commonly to hedge interest rate exposures or associated with bond issuance. So it's a very common product. Um, and in this particular example, it, this was a 10 year interest rate swap, but they can run out to you know, 30, 40 years, which is not, is not unusual. So why is, it, why is it computationally expensive to do this? Well, primarily because it's high, it's high dimensionality. Unlike a single derivative where you typically have to value it with, with one asset class with a small number of risk factors, because of the fact that you have to net all of these, all of the derivative positions together before you do the calculation, you end up with multiple currencies involved, multiple, multiple FX rates, equity prices, commodities, all get lumped together. So it ends up with a very high dimensionality. And that essentially forces you to use Monte Carlo, which is slow, but effective in very high dimension. It also requires many trades. So the bank, a bank would typically have 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 derivative transactions on it in its portfolio. And all of them have to be valued at every time step into the future and on every Monte Carlo path. Um, and, and quickly it adds up. Many Monte Carlo paths require for conversion. And very quickly you see that to obtain a basic XVA valuation, you have to calculate something like 10 to the power 11 trade valuations and do that on a daily basis. But then it gets worse because what you need to do is you need to manage risk, manage this portfolio as well. That means that we need to calculate sensitivities. And typically for XVA, given it's such a high dimensional calculation, we can easily see that we have 10 to the three to 10 to the four input market data points. And if you were to calculate finite difference approximations to all our input sensitivities, then we would require to repeat that basic XVA calculation, you know, something like you know, thousands to tens of thousands of times, which is clearly, which is clearly very, very expensive. So we don't want to do that. And how do we solve that computation problem? What we do, what we've done at Scotiabank, is we've used two techniques. One is to use GPU cards because they have thousands of cores. And obviously GPU cards are very familiar in the machine learning and deep learning space. Um, they're highly suited to Monte Carlo, just as, just as they're highly suited to deep learning. And we find that one seat GPU card is equivalent to 10 to the two to 10 to the three CPU cores. But even that is not enough because we need to do all those sensitivities and clearly find it difference is an expensive way of calculating it. So we've resorted to another technique called adjoint algorithmic differentiation, which calculates all first order sensitivities in around 10, 10 times the forward calculation. So in other words, instead of performing you know, 10,000 revaluations of the XVA, we can calculate it, we calculate it once and calculate the sensitivities using AAD in approximately 10 times the basic calculation. And that gives us a highly performant calculation. So where does the deep learning come, get come in? Well, to get that kind of performance, you have to write the code in CUDA. And you have to use AAD support libraries to do it. Well, that's all well and good for, for, you know, for the highly, you know, highly commoditized types of transaction. But the typical bank has thousands of different types of derivatives, each with their own valuation model. And if you want to go and, and build an XVA platform, you'd have to physically convert all of those derivative valuation routines into CUDA. And where you perhaps only have a handful of examples of less common trade types, that becomes expensive and difficult to do because you'd have to hand code every, every type of rare trade into CUDA. And for the more complex trade models, it, it becomes quite difficult to build a model that's suitable for GPU. So is there another solution to that? Well, there is, and we have a fantastic uh, way of doing that through deep learning. Um, deep neural networks, um, obviously through the, um, the, the, famous, uh, the famous universal function approximation theorem tells us that we can use deep learning and deep neural networks to approximate any function. 
Derivative valuation routines are just functions. They take input market data and they generate prices and derivatives. Um, and that's exactly what we do. So to, we can replicate a valuation model with very high accuracy using deep learning. But they, and that gives us several benefits. One is it gives us highly parallel inference on GPU. And um, it also gives us back propagation. So we use back propagation to train the deep neural network. But back propagation is exactly the same thing as our joint algorithmic differentiation. Um, it's just got a different name. So back propagation gives us AAD through our valuation routine for free. So what do we do? Well, we need to uh, we need to learn firstly learn the uh, the derivative valuation routine and. In a paper that, uh, that, uh, that Ryan Ferguson and myself wrote um, in 2018, we demonstrated that the deep neural networks could be used to approximate valuation models for all basket options. And I've referred to the universal function approximation theorem already, I told you to do that. And why would you do it? Well, deep neural network inference typically is very much faster than the original model. Um, and we can run thousands of valuations with parallel on the GPU. So the overall performance and inference is millions of times faster than the original model, which is typically coded in C++ or, or maybe Python or some other language. Um, as I said, DNA, the DNA can directly provide those adjunct sensitivities. Um, and it can also be generic. And this is one of the key elements. But instead of having to hand code the model in each model in CUDA for use on GPU, we train a deep neural network and then we build a deep neural network framework within our x platform and actually it becomes generic. You have to do some work to, to build the calculation of the state variables that you need to feed into that deep neural network. Um, but it, in essence, deep learning writes the code for you um, and, 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 and you don't have to do it yourself. What's the cost? Well, you need to train the deep neural network weights and that is obviously itself a difficult, different process. So how do we do that? Well, you need to generate a large training set of data um, via simulation. Um, we run a, a Monte Carlo simulation to generate uh, essentially random inputs to the model that cover the required training space. And you typically need to do generate millions of training examples, which is expensive, but that's a one-off exercise and it's offline. It's not part of the XGA calculation. We do it once, we train the neural network to replicate the valuation function, and then from, from then on, use the, the valuation function to direct the, the deep neural network in place of the valuation function. And you could use, for example, cloud hardware, hardware in periods of low demand to do that. Um, so train it, and again, then you've got to train the deep neural network itself. And how do you do that? Well, again, that can be an expensive process, but it is, of course, one off, um, offline, and you use GPU. And again, you could use cloud hardware for that. Okay, so let's bring it all together now and explain what the benefit, how these two things merge together: our XGA Monte Carlo simulation and the deep learning. So, what we're doing is we, so the DNN replicates an existing valuation model that you had before already built up in your in your quant library of, of valuation routines. The deep neural network replicates that existing model and typically it has the same set of inputs that that model has. Now, obviously there's some issues that we have to accommodate, typically for deep neural networks, we need to scale the inputs so that all of the inputs are sort of of the order of the order of uh, order of magnitude one. We may need to remove some redundant inputs. Sometimes you find that models have, you know, have scaling properties that allow you to reduce the dimensionality of the input space. So you can take advantage of that. Some of the inputs will be uh, floating point. There'll be market data inputs, um, yield curves, volatility surfaces, those kinds of things. Um, but some of the inputs will be categorical and related to the, to, to the properties of the trade rather than say market data. And the output, typically the model will have a single output, the value. Although in principle, it could have more than one output. And again, the outputs will probably need to be scaled to cope 
to cater for individual examples of trades by, for example, the notional uh, amount of the, of the trade. So we have all of these different types. We have three different types, so we can identify three different types of input, a constant, um, constants which are trade and categorical parameters, some time dependent parameters which relate to this. So for example, that might be the trade maturity. So as we move forward in time, we get closer and closer to the fixed trade maturity and hence the, the time, the time to maturity reduces and we have to accommodate that in our framework that surrounds the deep neural network. And then we also have path dependent things, uh, which are market inputs. Uh, and those are things which will um, be dependent on the Monte Carlo simulation itself. So in essence, we have three different types of inputs that vary at different, uh, vary at different times. Some of them are constants for, for every time step and every Monte Carlo path. Some of them are the same for every Monte Carlo path, but vary per time step. And some vary with, with both. So what do we want to do? Well, what we ideally want to do with this deep neural network is that we're, we're running it inside a Monte Carlo simulation um, for inference purposes. So we want to run it all with, run all of the paths for each time step in parallel as much as possible. So to integrate it is very straightforward. What we do is we generate a large matrix of inputs for the deep neural network, deep neural network and then we feed that into the deep neural network for all of our Monte Carlo paths and time steps. And then the deep neural network naturally outputs a vector or matrix of results that we just feed into the rest of the calculation. And on GPU, it's cheap. So what we're doing is we've already got our Monte Carlo simulation on GPU. So we just need to co-locate the Monte Carlo and deep neural network on GPU um, in order to take advantage of the fact that everything is co-located and the, all of the data that we need for the DNN and simulation are in the same memory space. So finally, before, right, before I get to the, the kind of the, the conclusions here, um, to integrate it, we also need to do those sensitivities. But given that we're already using um, adjoint calculations, all we need to do is to feed our existing adjoint calculation directly to the DNN that propagation, which is effectively the same as a symbolic adjoint. Um, and then we back propagate it and back propagate it out into our inputs to the deep neural network, and then they feed back through the rest of the or pre-existing adjoint calculations. So in conclusion, um, the, um, the, the deep neural network um, provides us a mechanism for um, replicating derivative valuations, um, providing a highly parallel, a device that will, you know, a method of doing highly parallel inference um, that we're able to co-locate with our existing GPU uh, Monte Carlo simulation and take advantage of essentially the best of both worlds. We, we can use GPUs and build our Monte Carlo framework. We no longer have to build a separate valuation routine for, for, each, uh, for, each, uh, for each different type of derivative we can train a deep neural network to do that in, instead and gain some efficiency in terms of both, uh, both the uh, building the implementation faster because we just, because we just need to build a deep neural network and also getting very fast inference and taking advantage of the performance gains and the adjoints that we get from deep neural networks. So that's an example of how we use deep, deep neural networks within an existing uh, quant model. And uh, this, um, this is now deployed in production. You can see it has light rays on it. Um, and um, we're able to uh, gain the benefits of deep learning within our, within our framework. So uh, that's it to conclude. There's a little bit of bibliography on, on here um, relating to this. Uh, so I encourage you to, to look at those references. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. If you could stop sharing your slides. Perfect. The audience is giving you a big virtual round of applause. Thank you so Thank much you. for sharing your insights with us. All right. For the audience, it's time for you to make your way to your next session. Along the way, don't forget to accept your connection request and check out our awesome AI exhibits. Thanks so much, and we'll see you around.